Hello, welcome to the Bossit Podcast with Mark Edwards and Michael Humblett. This podcast is released every week and is an over-the-shoulder look of a frank and candid discussion between two experienced software executives, providing you with useful tips, techniques, and the latest concepts to help you grow your software business in the fast-paced digital age. So let's get into it. Here is Mark Edwards and Michael Humblett. Hello, this is the Bossy Podcast, and today, from Belgium, I believe, I've not only got Michael on the other end of the call, I've also got Peter. Yeah, it's not only Michael here, it's also Peter, so I'm, I'm at a company called Round Media slash Prompto. We'll ask you the question, what all of that is, and I think we should have an extra guest on the po- uh, podcast, because so people actually realize it's it's real, Mark. It's not just you and me inventing this on an ethic. <laughs> but with, with, with real people. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Peter, maybe you very briefly, I mean, looking at you into the eyes, very briefly introduce what you do. So, uh, we founded a company three years ago uh, uh, that wanted to create software to create virtual reality content in a very fast way. Just imagine it, import a 3D file or draw, draw something yourself, start decorating it and start sharing it with the, uh, the whole world. So it's really that easy, just a, clip, a few click of the buttons and there it is. And your main target is? Our main target are the real estate developers and the architects. So yeah. and, uh, really in the real estate aspect. And they use it to do what? They use it to really sell their project before one brick has been laid down. True. So it's like, I would call the name photorealistic. I mean, it's like, it's not only 3D images, you can walk in it, but it just looks... Absolutely. Just fantastic. Honestly. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm excited, but it looks really good. Yeah. So, the, well, I, interesting yeah. Part, Mark, the interesting part is it's early days. How long do you exist? Like three years. Three years, and they've been growing like they've tripled their revenue almost every year. And now they're on the verge of making the, the jump between a lot of services doing it manually to a real software platform. So it's a very interesting phase, a very difficult one also. A very scary phase at the moment. Scary phase. But we're super convinced that we have something that is has a lot of potential. Yeah. So now Mark, now we we expect you to ask a very, very difficult question. Yeah. (laughs) This is a a difficult question to to christen Peter on our podcast. That's really nice. Now, when I actually saw the software demonstrated, I think it was last week, um, and I've been aware of the company for a little while now from when I went over to Belgium uh, before Christmas, and you'd mentioned uh, the company to me. So 3D is, is an area... Uh, and, and is a topic that's come up a number of times that I've had in discussions. I think the thing that really stood out to me was the speed that you could generate the, the 3D designs. Mm-hmm. And what was really interesting was that it's it can be used as a sales tool because you know when we, we talk about creating a canvas and the, the prospective uh, client needs to be able to visualize it where well, you can put this tool into the hands of lots of different people you know it can be used in lots of different ways but you're, you're talking about fundamentally at the moment it, it's about you know real estate it's about selling buildings it's about design that the aspect that really excited me was that it was very realistic and I think almost in front of their eyes you know you were talking about 90 minutes you could create something that looked very realistic even down to the time of day the season that it was in Uh, and as a photographer you know i appreciated that seeing the light coming in and being able to have something that they could start seeing themselves living there i think that that is very very powerful indeed um what's what's been the initial reactions peter that you've seen from clients when they've seen this because I'm used to or I was expecting to see the rendering of this you know you go away and you have something to eat while it while it works whereas this was almost instantaneous yeah it was a a super enthusiastic uh, review we got from our from our clients normally they are uh, they're familiar with the the whole 3d world uh, getting an image trying to change something having to wait for three hours then getting something back it's still not right and now we could just like instantly start changing, start adapting, start really 
designing together with, with the client into the things they really wanted. And that was something that they saw as, as a next phase within the whole uh, visualization and imagination markets. Uh, like we need to step away from the whole uh, imagination and, and trying to feel what something could look like you need to really see it and really put yes. things together and that's the, the whole new step the experience absolutely give it give everybody a pers personal experience uh, based on their own preferences and i feel that this is a very a very important next phase in the whole real estate market and far beyond of course the, the one of the challenges uh, that 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 they face if i if i may uh, peter is how do you price something like this because you could actually go into, I'm going to price it project-based or am I going to price And What's the kind of model you would apply to this? And, and there are many, many, many variances and nobody has done this before. So that's the really hard part because you either go high-end, you go low-end, you go for domination, you go for niche. Everybody, every stake has a different pricing. So I think... Peter has, knows how to do this. I think I'm looking at him very seriously. So what's, what's your opinion on this stage now? And we'll ask you back in a year time yeah. if it worked out. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> We're going to be checking up on you. Yeah, sure. Uh, let's hope I'm still as happy as I'm at now. <laughs> yeah. um, how I feel it, the last year we have been developing a software where we saw our competitors earning a lot of money, driving around in expensive cars and, and on services, on services, really on services, because there is a really, a, a really big demand on services. Uh, but the issue is always pricing is, is, is communication between the service the company and the client themselves. And we said, okay, the service, we can earn a lot of money as we speak, but if we could transform it into a software, we can put it into the market internationally. So that was really our, our like, uh, our intake on, on the whole market we want to create software that we can scale re very rapidly so that was the very first step so th the next step was okay and what strategy would we like to have we can uh, like price it very high and, and only aim for the like the big architects or the real really large real estate developers but we think that we should be able to enable the software for everybody that everybody can start creating starts uh, can start sharing content that everybody can see uh, what they're trying to design. And I feel like that is the, a very important step in our whole process. But, but, but it's scary for you because suddenly you're cutting prices like crazy and Absolutely. you're, you're, you're going to make a price that everybody can pay in the whole chain. But on the other hand, it will create a lot of traction, a lot of domination. It's a domination strategy. You want everybody in the world to use your software, Absolutely. even competitors, and then they can have the services. So we're now at the moment that we really need to take that step yeah. from services to SaaS to fully software, which is going to have an impact on our, our daily day-to-day -day work. So it's a really scary step, but we are convinced that it's a step that we need to take. And I think we need to overcome that fear. And I'm, I'm convinced if we can overcome that fear that we can start yeah. dominating the whole world. It's, it's by giving you will win. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So Mark... It's going to be so interesting in a year to talk again. Yeah, absolutely. And to yes. see how that worked out because because I understand, I mean, the scare is not only because you cannibalize your own revenues. That's the first thing to the quick revenue you lose. And the third element is that you will need cash and marketing to push this out. Absolutely. To, to come a, a, I mean, Belgian player, yes, you are dominant here. But going abroad, going worldwide, which is the aim, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a lot of cash, right? Yeah, I mean, that actually... Suddenly, Mark, be quiet because I know you're far away, Mark, but it is an interesting period. Huh? It's a really tough one because nobody has done this before in this space. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that that's happening in in a lot of the subsectors within the software sector is because this, this market has changed so quickly over such a short period. <clears throat> there are lots of people doing things that have not been done before. Um, so it's, it's very exciting times. Um, but there's always that element of, is this the right way? You know, I suppose that's what this, this, this podcast is about is, you know, it's a gathering of what we've seen that works within the market, but there's always people pushing out into, into new areas. That's, so, that's, uh, very interesting. 
the harder decision, the hardest decision, I think, we, when I look at the whole pricing discussion is what's the ultimate measurement? If you look at all the SaaS models, they always take one or two axes that they're aiming pricing around. And in this case, we, we, we had a long discussion and I think we landed it on units in building. Some people do it on emails. Some people do it on projects. Some people do it on, on transactions. I mean, there are many, many ways. But then you have to push it through the whole way and you have to cut some corners and cut some losses also because, no, yeah, there will always be people cheating the system and trying to do it. So that, that's going to be the real benchmark to see if that, that is the ultimate choice. I mean, actually, you, because you're the first one, you're going to set the scene how to do this. Absolutely. And I think the first step is really having that amount of active users per month that is going to define whether or not we're going to be successful or not. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, our primary fo focus shouldn't be the whole MRR, IRR thing, which is still very important, but also having that amount of users as actively using the software that we yes. can leverage on that. That's long term versus short term. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So it's yeah. always finding a balance between revenue and usage, and that's a, a very difficult balance, but I'm convinced that we can find it. Very it's, it's, Mark, it's like I'm watching this nature documentary and I see the lion singing up. <laughs> to, to, to the animal <laughs> and we're watching it live <laughs> will this work or not is he fast enough <laughs> <laughs> you know but seriously peter i i think it next to the fact that you guys are really brave and you're doing this i also think you have a very high chance of success because it's a very how to say educated guess it's like we've tested the mark we've tried we're going to go for it it is cheaper than a lot of other people we know this must work. The software works. It's I just think jumping, huh? Yeah, I think you've also got a a demonstration that's that's very compelling. When you start to look at it, I mean, <laughs> I've seen so many different software presentations and demonstrations over the years. Guys, most of them are dead boring, you know. I I am a bit cynical because I've just seen so many, but this did pull me in because I was I was it visually. It, it's it's a it's a pleasant experience, and and the speed of it. You're not waiting around to see for something to happen. You're not looking with it. It's very very visual. Visual. You know we are visual animal animals, and I think the fact that combined with that speed, you can see something build. I think that is something that you really need to leverage, and and you've done very well in getting there. I as you know, I brought in a colleague of mine who's got a lot of experience around three D. So he's seen a lot of these specifically, uh, and he came away and he was very impressed as well. And it, it, again, it was around the the realistic element to it and the speed. That was the first thing he said to me was, wow, I was expecting us to sit and watch this while it rendered. And it just didn't. It was happening really, really quickly. So you've got something that from a demonstration point of view is is very engaging. And I think you can leverage that and and hopefully with the right marketing, uh, get out there. Um, and if it's if it's easy to use, I mean, I like the fact that you're, you're focusing on active users because that, if you've got that number, you know that it's okay getting the subscriber, but oh, do they can keep using it? That's the real success element. Don't lose them. And I think I've seen software companies do that, i.e. that the, the customer interface, people become tired with it. They, they they like the idea of the software where it will give to them. They subscribe, but then they find that it takes too long to learn how to use it or they find it's too slow or whatever, and they stop using it, and then they stop becoming a subscriber. But quite often, that's a lot later. Knowing how many people are actively using it this week is great. And that means that you, you, your customer satisfaction, you know, the people that you're talking to now, I think you've got to focus on those, not just winning new customers, because that's another issue that I see with some software companies. They're always hunting for the new customer and they can neglect their existing ones who are really, really valuable. So, yeah, I mean, good luck with that. And it sounds yeah. like you, you've had a good, great start. And if I may add, I, I think the next the next following months should be a fully focused on user experience, trying to get the buttons and uh, the whole flow as simple as possible that that a lot of users just know how to use it in a very efficient and fast way. And I think that is the main fit, that, is, that, that there's absolutely no friction uh, between the client and our software. And I think that's 
a very important focus for the next following weeks and months. If you could make that intuitive so that people, you know, just pick it up. That that's what we're seeing. You know, we we are all being conditioned, if you like, by by the likes of uh, you know things like Facebook and Amazon. You don't you don't have a you don't have to have a handbook. You don't have to be trained in how to use it. It's intuitive. I think if you can make it that, it'd be interesting to know how you how you test that. You know, your sort of usability rating. How you how mm-hmm. you going to do that over the years? Because that I think will be very important. My uh, father-in-law is in the 70s, and he, he bought an iPhone like a few months ago, and he phoned me up with another phone, and he said, Michael, I don't get it. There is no manual with this thing. <laughs> How does it work? <laughs> anyway, um, I wanted to ask Peter a question because uh, Mark and I, during the podcast, we had lots and lots of topics we addressed, and one of the topics is always like... How do you balance your day? How do you cope with stress? And I mean, you are really in a hurricane. I mean, it's a tsunami. This is insane of people moving in and out and money and all that. How do you, how do you, how do you cope with focus and stress? He's not prepared for the questions. I'm just firing at them. So like, (laughs) what? Don't, don't, don't feel that you're being picked on Peter because Michael does this to me all the time. He throws these (laughs) questions at me completely out of the blue. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I guess I do so as well. Um, I, I really think it's about preparing your day very good. Uh, beginning of the day, uh, I have like a very good, I think a lot about what I'm going to do that day. Uh, at the end of the day, I didn't do like 90% of the things I wanted to do. It's yeah. super normal. But I feel like uh, it's, it's prioritizing, having to make sure, knowing what is super urgent and what could be, uh, what is less urgent. I, th- I feel like that is super important. And, and being able sometimes to let go. If you go to sleep, just let things go. Try to get that sleep, very important. And once you get back up, get back in that flow and, and, and try to start working again. And really, I think it's something I, I have evolved into. Uh, a, a year ago, I did everything myself. And now I'm really starting to work with people, trusting them with work I, they are have the responsibility over. And I feel like if you start growing in, into the, the form we are, are in at, at the moment, you need to depend on the, on the people that are better at, at, at the, uh, the specific, specific departments where they are working in. Mm-hmm. And I feel that like that is super important, having, having trust and being able to let some things go and, being, and making sure that I have the, the confidence that they will uh, provide what I, what I asked. Yeah, I that's, that's interesting. I, I agree with that. I think, um, you know, because I, I work sometimes with companies over quite a long period and they may go through several stages of growth and I think one of the issues that they can have is that the senior people within the company when you get to a certain stage and you want to move to that next level of growth you have to start doing things differently and people you know innately I think that we have a reluctance to change because what's got them to that stage has obviously been successful for them to get there. But what's going to take them further means working in a different way. And it's the ability to just sort of let go of that and say, OK, I may need, I may need to work in a different way now. And I think when you've got when you start out, you tend to be a bit of a jack of all trades. You're doing a bit of everything and you you get confidence in your own ability. And if you want it done, you tend to do it yourself. But that will only take you so far. And then you've got to change your mindset and say, okay, as you said, I've got other talented people around me now. I'm going to have confidence in them taking that. And I'm no longer the expert. You know, I I can see that in a lot of companies and some people really struggle with that and they're not able to do it. And we often are sort of challenging our clients and saying, actually, this is what you need to be doing in this way. And I can see them saying, well, that's not what we've done around here in the past. No, absolutely. But that's not what's going to take you on that journey for greater growth. It's, it's a difficult one. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I, I do a lot with sales teams or market, it doesn't matter, teams, if, if I, see, I ask them about the people, if I see them struggle, I'll ask them, say, well, do you trust the person or not? to do it. I mean, not now, but maybe in a few months or a few weeks, if you're training well enough. And then if I see the hesitance, I say, well, you, you'll need to let go of the person because if you can't trust them. You have to swap him or her. You have to swap them out. There's not a way. Otherwise you'll never, you'll always do it yourself. And that's not scale, scalable. 
Yeah, and it's really a time aspect. Yeah, it's pure yeah. time. If you're yeah. in a mature company, you can like really coach that person into the person you would like him to become. But in, 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 in a startup scale-up company, it's, it's all about speed and it's about getting the results as quickly as possible. So sometimes we need to take that hard decision and yeah. letting some people go. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's a people business. Absolutely. At the end of the day, it's always a people business. Yeah, and I, and I think also you can gravitate to areas within the business which you enjoy. But if you're the leader within the organization, that may not all, always be the right thing for you to be focusing on at the time. Because you will have a background, which means that you will have a bias towards you know, strategic or marketing or sales or technical. And the tendency is that you want to fall back into that role almost and focusing on that area. And I think sometimes, you know, your job is I'm the leader and I need to be pointing the way and I need to be making sure that I'm re removing the obstacles for the people that are working and within the business. Uh, and that can be difficult. You know, I've said to Michael many times, and I see this over and over again, is when I first look at a software business or any business, you look at the founders or the leaders within that business, find out their background and the profile of that company will be very similar. You know, if it's if they're techies, if it's a group of techies, that's going to be a very technical business, and typically the marketing is not going to be strong. You know, and you need a you need a balanced business. It needs to be like a building with many strong columns of equal weight and strength to create a balanced business, and uh, that can be tough as well. But I think once you start to put that in place, I think um, it does get a bit easier. It change it's about changing your mindset. I think Peter is now crying of your wisdom, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never sure if you're if you're being serious, <laughs> and how much you're taking the Mickey. Actually, ninety percent of the time, you are taking the Mickey when you say things like that. I've noticed that. Seriously, <laughs> Mark. <laughs> no, I'm very happy with that wisdom. So thank you very much, Mark. Uh... <laughs> You're so much politer than Michael. I think you ought to be on this podcast with me every week. I mean, it would be it would be so much easier. <laughs> you pushed me. You pushed me to the truth, and I'm giving it to you, Mark. Uh, he's not interested in this, so I said, I just said, I'm here. Why don't you join? He's like, Do I need to prepare? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm just pulling back a little. We'll see what we're. <laughs> yeah. You know, when I when I came across to Belgium, and I spent a couple of days with Michael. He said to me at one stage, I think we were having dinner, he said, the best thing about you coming across is I've got more opportunities to annoy you. <laughs> <laughs> that was his perspective on the whole thing. <laughs> I really feel like your friendship is... is it's stupening, it's, it's, Yeah, it's super valuable. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, hey, Mark, uh, before we, we head off, because we, we're doing this for a while now, you had a question, you got a question. I, I remember you sending me an email saying, Michael, now we finally got a real question. Yes. Yeah. Well, we've had several questions come through. I don't think we'll be able to cover all of them, but I'm getting some good questions coming in. The first one, yeah. I'm a bit reluctant to say this one because it's not an easy one. And um, it's, I'm, I'm going to throw this one at you, Michael, and maybe Peter can throw in some ideas. It gives me a bit more thinking time as well. Here's the question. So is my company worth more if it operates in several countries? Or is 10 million revenue the same value if it's all from the same geographic place? In other words, is the risk and cost of global expansion really worth it? Off you go, Michael. <laughs> well, that's, the, that's actually that's a very good question. And actually, it is. it's one of the challenges that I'm, I'm looking at, Peter. That's one of the questions, actually, they're struggling because they'll have a certain stage in a few months. They'll need some cash, extra cash, some investment. Yeah. Um, do you want to start? Yeah. You, go, you go ahead. You I have a very, very straightforward idea about that. I think that having international deals is way more important than having like 10 million in revenue just in your in your own country. I know a lot of, of Belgian startups that are uh, having like 100,000 MRR, but mainly in Belgium. And they really struggle to sell that software into net, in the Netherlands or in the UK because the system is totally different that we are what we are uh, what they are experiences in belgium so is there a potential absolutely otherwise you wouldn't have like a hundred thousand uh, mrr but is does it have international uh like like uh traction i don't know at the moment for me it's a different topic eh? so either you have a let's say if you compare it to like let's say belgian vision uh, business you would have like a boutique type of business you can make a lot of money no discussion 
but purely valuation, if, I think if you go abroad, you'll need to deal with more systems. Your software needs to be more, if it's software, needs to be more robust. You'll have a bigger base, you'll have a bigger potential, and you'll eventually have a much bigger scale. But it doesn't mean you as a founder or CEO will be more happier because you just exponentially enlarge your problems. And you have so much parameters to take into account. Interesting. Well, Showing it back over. The is it? I mean, it's a it's a big question, isn't it? I think um, there's a number of different ways to answer this, and I, I I never like to sort of sit on the fence, so I like to come down on one side or the other. But I think that there are there are a few things that you would need to consider. Is at what stage is that current company currently? Because I think in the in the earlier stages, what's very important is you want to get that business to profitability very quickly. I do see a danger in the software sector at the moment because it attracts a lot of investment. And investment is great. It can be like fuel. I'm not saying you should always go out and get investment. If you can do it without investment, great. You've got more equity within the business. But I think one of the downsides is that it can put you into a little bit of a surreal world where you're not having to generate profit you're going to need money because that is obviously the fuel and cash is king. But I've seen companies, I had one, I had a conversation, I think I might have mentioned it to you, Michael, a few months ago, where this company had been developing this software for 18 months. And they had a couple of handfuls of people within the business. So they'd raised a reasonable amount of money. They'd not sold anything at all in 18 months. And my immediate concern was they could go out into the market and the market say, Nope, not interested. It just is not of interest to us. So I think, and this again comes back to that issue about the technical people, the software developers, they want to get quickly involved in, in developing the software, whereas somebody on the sales side would probably want to go out into the market and start selling it. And I think you, you need a bit of a balance there. There's no harm in doing some pre-selling, going out, talking to the market, telling them about what's going to happen, um, and that can also give you some very valuable feedback for you to, for the development of the software. So make sure that it's profitable. I think the other aspect is, I think what Peter said about being based in Belgium, I think to, for a Belgium based company to show that they've got that international reach, I think is very valuable. I don't think that that necessarily uh, is as important in the early stages if you're based, in, for instance, in the USA. It's such a massive market. Um, so that's something else to, to put in place. And I think also one of the other things is software from 20 years ago, of selling of that is different to it is to nowadays where you're seeing more and more self onboarding where somebody, and it depends on obviously the value of the software or who your target market is, um, whether it's B2C or B2B, but there are B2B solutions where people will just come to your website and sell. And sorry, and buy that, and they can onboard themselves. That means that the support in the region doesn't have to be as high. So that means that you can make that step more quickly. But if you're selling, you know, a solution that's going to cost in the hundreds of thousands, there's going to be technical support and probably sales support that's going to be needed in those regions. So that takes you back to your profitability issue. Is you probably need to do it at a, a more measured state, um, and obviously. From my view in, in the M&A world, we're always building a business. And actually, you know, I think that should be the same for every single software entrepreneur there. Always be building it with that exit in mind. When you get to the exit, is the business going to be more valuable if it's got an international customer base? Generally, yes. Not, But not always. I think if you if you were just in one region... And it was a software solution that um, did require a lot of sales support and technical support, but there was still a lot of headroom within that geographic region, then you could still have probably as an equally valuable business, not to all potential buyers. So what I'm saying is they could acquire that business, but they could still see there's lots of growth potential. But if you were, for instance, in Belgium and you dominated Belgium and there was you, you're going to have to work harder and harder to get that remaining part of the market, 
then obviously then that would start to reduce that value you would need to at least show that you're able to sell internationally how much business you've got internationally again was something that you could probably you would need to judge on a case by case basis so the fact that you've got some customers in different regions and you've had those for some time you've managed to hang on to those you managed to win it and, and keep them um, that may be enough um, but if you've got something that actually you can support on an international basis without a massive cost base you may want to make that decision sooner um, well that's my best answer anyway it's a bit com maybe a bit complex and a bit long but um you know that's that that's how i saw it i just remember you sitting on a fence <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you get splinters in very unpleasant places if you sit on the fence so i try I not do that iron my friend iron doesn't give you splinters but it... <laughs> <laughs> if i understand it correctly it's about what the total market potential is so in the us it's totally different than, the, than in belgium the type of vc and the type of product yeah it's 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 a number of different variables i think also the other the other factor there is if you're looking at that the equity value of your business which i'm, I'm always you know bashing the drum about you need to be doing that all the time if you're in the us then there are there is a lot of money in the us and they are hungry for businesses in fact i think something we're seeing more of the american companies now starting to look internationally because there's so much acquisition that's gone in the us so if if you had a strong you say you had a 10 million pound revenue business in the us it's unlikely that that would be anywhere near its potential so you could still have a very valuable business mm -hmm. um, but it wouldn't be the same if you were you were talking about you know Belgium or Norway or Sweden or something like that or even even the UK although the UK for Europe probably UK and Germany are the two biggest uh, markets um, so it, it is about that headroom that that potential that you've got for growth because nobody wants to acquire a business for the value that it's at they always acquire it for the potential value that's the, that's the important thing so not a simple answer but a very good question. So thank you very much. That was from another Peter, actually. So uh, thank you from Peter. I'm just looking at the time, guys. We are at 32 minutes. Any Anything that you wanted to say before we started to wrap things up? It was a pleasure to have you, Peter. Thank you very much. We'll do this in a few months again. So we'll, we'll hear where the, where the journey takes you. I Absolutely. think it's going to be interesting to watch the lion jump on his prey. And uh, Mark, I'll pass it on to you. No, brilliant, Peter. You know, as I said, very impressed with what you've done so far and just keep up the energy and keep going. And uh, thank you for joining us today. No problem. So that, that was the uh, Bossit podcast uh, talking about unlocking the software industry one conversation at a time with Michael Humbley, myself, and this time with Peter. If you've enjoyed the episode, please subscribe, like, comment, and share. Thank you and goodbye. Thanks, guys. Goodbye. Bye.